essentially what's the model for success. And it used to be if you drive top line growth and you drive profit and you drive efficient capital allocation, it's success, that's business. And what we added pretty near to the start of this new chapter was sustainability and responsibility on equal footing. And the emotion, the belief, and the commitment, the feeling of commitment on sustainability is very high. And the anxiety on actually delivering is equally as high. I don't come across naysayers, but I come across leaders who are nervous because there's a lot we have to learn, a lot we have to do, there is absolutely a business case, but it's not gonna return on a kind of three or four year, uh, you know, return on investment. This is taking a bit of a longer time horizon. Welcome to Straight Talk, where we cut through the BS and get straight into real conversations with some of the best minds on the planet. I am your host, Af Mahotra. I am blessed to be leading these extraordinary discussions and asking tough questions that then elicit insightful answers accelerating our awareness of the biggest issues. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on wherever you are. I'm Af Malhotra, your host on Straight Talk. And once again, I have the pleasure of inviting some of the most extraordinary guests on the show. Today is that much more special because it is someone who was uh, with us right at the beginning, at one of our first shows, and this person, actually did a lot of things for us. Not only was the show magnificent and enriching and enlightening and inspiring, but this person actually defined how we actually go off and interview people in the, in the future. And we spent a lot of time talking about the personal story, the why. Why do I do what I do? What does it really mean for me? How is it changing my behaviors? And how does that affect my job role, my executive position? my decision-making, my relationship with people. It was amazing. And so today I'm delighted to have the great, uh, friendly, beautiful, amazing, and incredible leader, Stacey Tank, with me again. Uh, welcome, Stacey. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, and it's great to be back. Yeah. Always. It, it comes naturally. It comes naturally when, when we see you. And uh, Stacey is uh, looking after transformation and corporate affairs at Heineken. We know that. And when we had you first a while back, a large part of our conversation was about this whole uh, debate and issue around what we call climate realism and sustainability, um, which happens when you transform, right? It happens when you try and transform an organization. And when you're trying to transform the organization, you've got to make sure that you're communicating internally and externally so everyone knows that you're doing the right things for the right reasons and making a real difference. And at that point, we talked about a lot of stuff, greenwashing, what's real, what's not real, and so on. Since then, it's been a while. Tell us where you are today. What's going on in your world today? Um, tell us the good stuff, but please do tell us the hard stuff as well, because it's straight talk. So over to you, Stacey. Great enough. Thank you. Yeah, it's been such an interesting couple of years. So I rejoined Heineken in June 2020, June 1st, 2020, which was an interesting day because we had a new CEO coming into his role after a couple of decades with the company promoting up through and many, many other brand new members of the executive team taking the reins. Big generational change in leadership. And actually this afternoon, I was reading something about this big generational leadership change that's coming as the baby boomers are retiring and the next generation, Gen X, maybe some millennials are starting to get into the C-suite. We had a, a CEO for 15 years who was there who retired. So in our case, just a natural succession, although we were in the middle of COVID, in the middle of all the turbulence. But what that created for us in the sense of COVID was happening and when you're in the hospitality business and bars and restaurants are closed, it's not nice when your customers are suffering, everybody is suffering. So there was the kind of obvious element, but it was a catalytic force in many other ways. It allowed us to look at what we thought success would need to look like for this next phase, this next chapter of the company of 158 year old family company that's been around for a while through many seasons. Uh, through many world wars, through many uh, tragedies, through the depression, through many innovation and technology cycles, industrial revolution. And what was helpful about that moment is that everyone had a very open mind to think about things differently and to accept that what got us here won't get us there. 
So we started yeah. by looking at our value creation model, essentially what's the model for success. And it used to be if you drive top line growth and you drive profit and you drive efficient capital allocation, it's success, that's business. And what we added pretty near to the start of this new chapter was sustainability and responsibility on equal footing. And from there, we tried to pull this concept of balanced growth through the system, through the way that we simply run the company. So now we have scorecards when you're sitting down for your business review and saying, hey, did I gain market share? What's happening with my innovation rate, my advertising spend? You're also saying, how am I doing on decarbonization? How am I doing on my water efficiency? How am I doing on my inclusion ambitions, et cetera, et cetera? We've now tied remuneration to that diamond, to those four things. So yes, you're compensated if you drive classic growth, you're also compensated if you decarbonize this business, become more efficient with water and become more inclusive. Um, specifically, we have a measurable uh, KPI on gender that's tied to remuneration. So it pulls all the way through all the planning processes, all the ways that we engage our supervisory board. We now have a dedicated supervisory board committee focused on sustainability and responsibility. We have steer codes that govern certain aspects of the agenda, like our innovation agenda. Um, we also have one on sustainability and responsibility that our CEO chairs looking after and shepherding our brew a better world, sustainability and responsibility ambitions. Mm -hmm. So we started with a notion that we believed business can be a force for good, that the equation has to change going forward. And hearing the generation of leaders, the Paul Pullmans that came before that painted this picture for us. But we feel very much that we're the generation that needs to take that baton and deliver the goods. Now it's time to take a theory and pull it all the way through your business and grow sustainably. And having the belief and the full support of the executive committee of the supervisory board, in our case of the Heineken family, has been a huge, huge multiplier for us and getting things to weave into the fabric much faster. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of work to do. And this is more than, you know, hope is not a strategy kind of thing. This is incredibly brutal, detailed road mapping work. We have 80 operating companies all over the world, 200 plus breweries. And on our decarbonization ambition, for example, we'll decarbonize in production by 2030, and then we'll go for full value chain decarbonization, net zero, we have SBTI um, approach by 2040. So we need a roadmap for every single operating company by quarter, by year. Um, we have over 9,000 initiatives in our funnel to reduce our energy use, to replace that energy, electrical and thermal heating energy, which is much harder to decarbonize to replace all of that piece by piece. So you can't take your eye off the ball for one minute because this thing is big and complicated and highly interdependent. Um, but it starts, you know, every day it's a little more clear, uh, but a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I think you summed it up beautifully. I, I think one of the things I remember the last time you chatted with us was this uh, idea of incentives for people. Uh, to drive the right behaviors. I'm not sure if it was implemented then, but I think it was being discussed. And so it's great to see that you've implemented it under the auspices of the balanced sort of growth uh, mantra or, or model. So tell me a little bit about this, um, some of the real questions around climate realism, right? So when a big company like yourselves, again, family owned, massive support from the board, which is amazing, absolutely terrific. It's a good, it's a great start, in fact, not a good start, a great start. Then uh, let's talk about um, some of the tougher stuff, you know, uh, surely not everyone's on the same page and everyone's like, yeah, absolutely, Stacy, totally bought in. You've got to have resistance. You've got to have naysayers or as I call them, rigidites, you know, like Luddites, but rigidites uh, who, who just, you feel like saying, oh, change, will you? What's wrong with you, man? Right. Could be a woman. What's wrong with you, person? And um, so t tell us how that's going for you because, uh, you know, some of the warts. Indeed. This is hard for a lot of reasons. It's technically hard. It's not for free, to put it mildly. Um, sometimes I hear people say, oh, it pays for itself. Maybe, in, yes, in the long run, certainly you could do a model, but today it's not for free. And also with our leaders, we just had our top 150 leaders here in Amsterdam from all over the world for the first time since 2019, because 
COVID gave us all the complexities of uh, not being able to travel for a long time. And we got together to talk about Evergreen, our balanced growth strategy. And we had, of course, lots of discussions on sustainability as part of that. And the emotion, the belief, and the commitment, the feeling of commitment on sustainability is very high. And the anxiety on actually delivering is equally as high. And that's because you can tell our leaders, you need to deliver this growth ambition, or you need to launch this new product, or you need to figure out a new route to market, or you know, name a business challenge. They've done it. We've done it for 158 years. But no one has decarbonized the business before. No one. And that's scary. We're really in the unknown and we have to lock our arms and we have to work together in an environment where we're also juggling many, you know, balls on fire in terms of growing the business and delighting consumers, but also navigating massive supply chain disruption, input cost inflation, a war on the continent, stagflation recession coming, major challenges around talent, the employee value prop and social contract really changing with employees. So this is not a simple time to be trying to do something that is very hard that we have never done before at this scale. So there is, I wouldn't say um, there aren't, I don't come across naysayers, but I come across leaders who are nervous because there's Mm -hmm. a lot we have to learn, a lot we have to do. And also you have to take a bite, you know, you have to go piece by piece and eat this apple one bite at a time. So to start, we focused on our biggest emitters. We looked at 70, 80% of our carbon emissions, and that's, let's call it 15 or so operating companies. So if we have 80 operating companies and we focused on 15, there are 65 who have higher anxiety because we have not talked to them that much yet. And they're sitting there going, I want to do this and I want to have fully circular packaging and I want to, you know, go for the most water efficient brewery and I want to decarbonize, but they're not getting the support yet from some of these technical experts that they do deserve and that is coming. So communication, like you were saying, bringing everyone along on the journey, making sure that the knowledge, the solutions are getting lifted up out of silos because they get trapped in these functional silos or geographic silos, Mm -hmm. but lifting that knowledge up and moving it across to serve everyone so we can go faster, Mm -hmm. lifting it up. and And often we should be also sharing it outside the company because these are technologies that would benefit many different industries in some cases, working with our, you know, tens of thousands of vendors in our full value chain who very much need to be with us on this journey as well, because only 10% of our footprint is in production. 90% of our emissions are in cooling, packaging, agriculture, logistics, and beyond. So, yeah. So I wouldn't say to answer your question definitively, not a lot of, of overt blocking, but quite some butterflies in the stomach. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And and when you think about, I just want to ask you a question about cost because large companies, uh, whilst they've got great intentions, you've got to put in money. You've got to put in upfront capital to make all of this change happen. And you said that yourself a second ago. So how do you figure that out? So let me let me paint the scenario for everyone's benefit. So you're a company like Heineken, you want to do good things. You've got legacy environments right? You've got stuff you used to do yesterday. Now you've got to do things differently tomorrow. It's just not going to happen for free, or it's not just going to be a clear switch. Someone's got to pay some money to a bunch of suppliers. Um, You've got to install a new kit. You've got to redo other stuff. Where do you find the money from, number one? And when you do find the money, how long does it take for payback? Yes, indeed. So depending on the type of business that you're running, you can achieve some of these things in different ways. In our case, we're a brewer with over 200 breweries, malteries all over the world. So we are capital intensive, intensive, as you said. And when we build a brewery, that brewery is there 60, 70, 80, 100 years more. So it's a big footprint. It's an asset heavy footprint. And that means indeed you have to invest. There's good news in all of this, especially if you plan ahead, because there are things that you can do, some of the power purchase agreements that we've signed, where our effective energy costs for renewable electricity, which is one third of the energy we need in the breweries, is actually lower, sometimes much lower than the market rate. So sometimes you can actually save, no question about it. And then there are equipment changes, the way that you're going to derive your thermal energy, we're leaning into technologies like heat pumps, 
biogas, um, sustainable biomass, other technologies that do require CapEx. And sometimes you're already on a replacement cycle anyway, so you can take a look at the technologies you have and when is the right moment to potentially change them. You ask yourself all kinds of questions like the life of these assets and you know, what's the smartest way to do that. The reality is if you model out, and we've just done our first uh, task force for climate-related disclosures modeling, which was incredibly interesting. And for any business that hasn't done it yet, so many are, are doing it now. We certainly were not the first to do it, but it really was a worthwhile exercise. I think sometimes you go into these modelings or these sort of disclosure exercises and think, okay, it's a bit of um, good hygiene. We want to be transparent. It's a good thing to do. In this case, I feel there were some very actionable operating insights about the journey that we're on with water carbon uh, and beyond. And in that instance, you can see that if you model things out far enough, there is absolutely a business case, but it's not going to return on a kind of three or four year uh, you know, return on investment. This is taking a bit of a longer time horizon, but it's business continuity. It's the right thing to do if you look what's happening uh, all over the world. And so out of all of our Brew a Better World commitments, carbon and water, incredibly important, are some of our, our most complex uh, topics to tackle. And we set out when we launched Evergreen, so probably a year, year and a half ago now, a 2 billion euro cost out ambition. And that cost out ambition is funding things like our sustainability journey. And another insight right. for us has been over the years, we were decarbonizing and working on these topics, but not at the pace, this new pace of ambition that we have now. But we would potentially allocate, you know, capital or, or things would be kind of earmarked at the beginning of the year, and then things would change. And sometimes the investments become a little bit squishy and you say, well, I'm going to pull this one forward and maybe this one goes back or... So what we've reflected on is the importance of ring fencing, essentially that capital, having lists of all of the projects and really governing it at a more specific level of detail to make sure that these things are happening, but also to make sure if we're getting delayed, that we understand mm -hmm. why. And that might be a top to top meeting with one of our engineering partners because we need more heat pumps and we can't wait another 24 months to get the heat pumps. So there are things, if we can see little signals coming up across the world, there are things we can do in the center to uh, aggregate those little signals coming up and hopefully do something to help the operating company. Mm. Yeah. So in other words, um, in other words, there is a capex, there is a cost, there is change that's going to happen. I guess it goes back to the point around acceptance, you know, accepting that you've got to put in to get out um, mm -hmm. ethically, but also for the sustainability of the business, which is great. Um, I, it kind of helps to have a family company, doesn't it, to a large extent? We, I wonder. We do have shareholders. Yeah, we are traded. So we're very happy yeah. to have the family. And we, of course, love our shareholders that are publicly traded as well. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> Without question. So uh, let's let's talk about another element, which is the ecosystems, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to do this, you talk a lot about the internal, which is obvious, and then you've got the external side where you've got to find these micro ecosystems or like a huge grand ecosystem where you're partnering with suppliers, vendors, um, I don't know, uh, data companies, mm -hmm. AI companies, mm -hmm. uh, analytics companies. Uh, heat pump companies and so on. So how has your supplier sourcing and procurement side of things evolved? Because uh, let me just be provocative. Procurement people generally um, haven't always been seen as the most, uh, you know, ahead of the curve. You know, they've sort of lagged. Um, that might be historic. It's to do with whether they were given attention or love or not. It's changing in many companies. Mm -hmm. How have you guys dealt with that? Yeah. You know, for my supply chain and procurement colleagues, I think sometimes you might wistfully look across the office at your marketing colleagues and think, wow, those folks have the best job in the company. I have to say, this is the moment for supply chain and this is the moment for procurement. This is some of the coolest, most important work that any of us are going to work on our entire life. When I'm a grandmother and I'm in my rocking chair and hopefully I have some beautiful grandchildren and some sweet dogs, you know, laying on the porch. I'm going to tell them stories about how we were scared to death 
but we went for it on decarbonization and the journey over 18 years to get there and all the things we did to work together and to find the way. You know, sometimes af I think about, you know, Apollo 13 when they got into trouble up in the in the shuttle and they were going to suffocate, I think, or be poisoned by the air, as I recall, and they had to build some filters to survive. And down at Mission Control, they put everything that was in the shuttle and available to the astronauts, they put it in a cardboard box. And they came into the conference room and they dumped over the box. And they said, this is what you have to work with and you have this much time, go. You know, pressure makes a diamond. And so for procurement, supply chain, this is the moment to show all the amazing problem solving skills, mobilizing movement making skills that these leaders have visioning skills to get big segments of our supplier base, like our cooling providers or our packaging providers together, link arms, mm -hmm. sign up for science based targets, and then figure out how are we going to deliver the goods. Last year, mm -hmm. our procurement folks, for example, got our top 25 cooling providers. So we do refrigeration. It's a, we have a lot of fridges because beer is consumed cold if you want it to taste good <laughs> most of the time. Um, so we introduced our new ambitions around science-based targets, um, 2030 in production, 2040 in the value chain, which means by 2040, we need their scope one and two to be, uh, mm. to be reduced down to net zero according to the science-based target gold standard. And we said, join us, join us on this journey. And I believe all or all but one, but I think all of them have now taken up the charge and they're adopting science-based targets. This year we did it in a package, the future summit. We got 70 to 80% of our packaging footprint uh, suppliers together. And we invited the same thing, join us on the mission. And by the way, how do you think about this? What are you worried about? What are the barriers and how can we help? So we're starting a climate school because one of the things they said is we need knowledge. Sometimes they say we need access to reasonable financing, uh, other types of challenges that we really should work together and uh, take the roadblocks out of the way. And frankly, some of these companies are bigger than we are. So there's also so much we can often learn from them. So being in dialogue, creating an ecosystem to help the ecosystem is uh, yeah, certainly the way to go. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. I, I, love, I love it. And I, I love the fact that you're championing the supply chain folk as well, because uh, I know a lot of them and I do feel for them sometimes, I have to say, in this whole digital transformation era, they almost got lost uh, in the system. And I think, yes, this is their moment. I'll remember that. That's one of the quotes from this episode for sure. <laughs> Uh, let, let, let's move on to another topic, which is about people and gender and uh, general diversity, but related to the same topic. Uh, again, an important question, because I'm sure people think it. So when you think about changing people's minds and influencing people, mm. albeit dealing with anxiety, because I'm one of the 65 and you've taken care of the, you know, the others, then um, again, I'm going to ask it. Do you find it uh, that women are easier to work with because they're just accepting of change at a, at, at a um, especially this sort of unknown stuff because they're used to dealing with a lot of things at the same time, family life, home life, um, definitely better multitaskers, at least for me. I mean, there's no question and better leaders actually now we're doing this conversation. Do you think it's easier to work with women than work with men? It's interesting in the context of Heineken because I actually see more nuance on the cultural dimensions than on gender, because we're in 80 countries that from uh, Laos to Vietnam to Sierra Leone to Brazil, Mexico. So I noticed that culturally, there's a different relationship to the balance of listening and talking or collaborating kind of group versus individualistic or um, debate across versus follow a, a more um, hierarchical model. And those things can really impact team dynamics. And you have to be really aware to create an environment where, for example, if someone comes out of a hierarchical culture, that you make them feel very safe and welcome to be able to speak truth to power a little bit and really incentivize that because otherwise you're not going to hear their voices necessarily. But we need all genders we need lots of cultural representation, folks that also represent different generations. I think now we have four or five generations in the workforce, 
which is a huge gift because we have a lot of different perspective and, uh, and capability. So a lot of work to do. I find when you're in a team where there's no majority culture, there can often be a kind of uh, more seamless integration and high adaptability and flexibility because you have to. But if you have a team in which you have a majority culture and then lots of others, you have to be even right. more intentional about what that looks like, feels like, so everyone feels safe and like they can belong. Because if you're in the majority, you probably don't even realize you might start speaking that majority language that others don't understand. You might fall into your cultural norms, which might feel others feel unsafe or like they can't speak up and belong. And that's more the risk to me that I see in, in our ways of working than just strictly on gender lines. Yeah. yeah. And with the young people, uh, that's a good one because they're, they're such an important part of our future, right? And a lot of what we're doing today, let's be honest, is to create a better world for them. Even when you're sitting on your porch, it's the grandchildren, right? Or yeah. their children yeah. that we're actually doing this. So that purpose is there. How do, you, how do they behave and how are they responding to this uh, sustainability agenda? I mean, you know, what, what how do they how do they respond to you, the strategy, and how supportive are they? Where do you see the bright spots, but also where do you see some of the gap areas? I had lunch uh, with our interns a few weeks ago, and it was amazing to hear first their personal stories because they had all done some extraordinary things, living all over the world in between their studies or during their studies, serving communities in underserved uh, areas across the world, really interesting geographical places across cultures. They had a service orientation and an adventurous um, willingness to kind of go into the unknown that I really admired. And I also observed, frankly, they've been through a lot of trauma. COVID was not easy on people who were in their kind of teens and 20s at all. And it makes me really sad for the folks who missed their prom. I know there's no prom in Europe, but there's prom where I'm from and prom is big, or you miss your graduation or you miss the parties. You know, when I was in high school, what did you do? You played, you know, I played sports. I did music stuff. I went to parties and I, you know, school dances and all these things that just didn't happen for a couple of years. And the fear, the sadness, the loneliness has left a mark on, on young people. And I really hope that we can kind of shake this off. And for them, they can spend the next few years having a wonderful, you know, adventure and thriving. But I also think, realistically, this will leave some type of impression. You hear them also talking about things like climate anxiety. They're scared for what's coming. And I'm scared for yeah what's coming and they're looking at people like me and they're saying you know is it going to be okay and what are you doing about it because I am 25 years old or 22 years old and maybe I can join an organization and make my part but you have a huge influence systemically on what's going to happen are you doing your part and I appreciate them asking those questions because we better be doing our part but we need them too and I hope because one of the fears that I have is that you can become disenfranchised by big institution and you can say, I'm not, I, I kind of write off big business or I write off this other segment of organizations that you could join to be part of massive systemic change. And I hope young people will still consider joining and helping us to bring this agenda to, uh, to fruition. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. I love that. I, Cause I do feel that the young, the young person of today, uh, is going to be a central sort of catalyst, especially for these programs that we're running, uh, sustainability being one of them. Also D, D and I, you know, mm-hmm. with diversity, inclusion, belonging and so on, because I think their their mental framework, their value systems are sort of, they've been engineered differently, not better or worse, just different. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot to learn. And you have kids too, uh, you, my, yours yeah. are older than mine, but I think there, there, are, there are teachers, aren't they, to a large mm-hmm. extent? Um, when it comes to this stuff. So I think, um, so there's an, there's, let's switch gear for a moment. And there is something you touched on earlier on and you, you, you'll describe it, which is born out of the pain that we're suffering today. I mean, I remember, you know, during COVID, there was a different sort of pain, like chaos. 
and uncertainty. And it's a little bit of that again, isn't it, really, a year and a half later or so, where we're seeing, like you quite rightly said, the economic pressures, stagflation, inflation, um, the war in Ukraine, which is causing a heap of uh, uncertainty, unintended consequences, actually, which we don't even know, of course, don't know about right now. Call them storm clouds, if you want to call them that. Uh, how how do you see that affecting the culture of a company and, mm. and the mindset? Because, you know, you're on a mission, right? You want to do the sustainability thing. But let me put this to you now. Um, here's something that worries me. And I, and I love your viewpoint. So sustainability and we're on that train and it's bullet and we're doing really well going fast but then this has happened and ukraine has come about and the war is happening and commodity prices have gone sky high and oil oil will go up in price to what i don't know 150 175 whatever a barrel some countries in the world won't be able to afford it and start using you know fossil fuels coal essentially mm -hmm. and that just kicks the entire strategy in the dustbin frankly because everyone's got to play their part for the net zero mes message to an agenda to really s to come through it can't be just one heineken it's got to be many heinekens or many companies doing it yeah. how do you deal with that culturally then surely that's having an impact in some way yeah a couple of reflections covid reminded us and helped us be more adaptable and flexible and i don't think we knew it at the time but we were training for this chapter because in this chapter, we're gonna to have to be even more resilient and adaptable in a different way. Yeah. So it continues and uh, we, we're in an extended crucible moment. I think we'll all look back and think, wow, how much did we grow? How much did we learn? And of course there's trauma in that too, um, but this is a moment where leaders can really step up and lead. In the world that we live in, you know, on my phone, I have, I don't know, 10 news apps, all the alerts are coming. All these things are giving me uh, a little micro dose of anxiety as I am faced with things that I cannot change, that are really scary or sad about what's going on in the world. And that can feel overwhelming. I think it's partially why we have such a mental health crisis in many parts of the world, because we used to grow up in these villages. I come from a little village and my husband comes from a little village where you basically know a very big portion of the families. And the, the worst thing you're worried about is, you know, some teenager spray painted on the football field or, or Mr. Smith's cows got loose and they're blocking traffic in the morning. You know, these were local problems. Now we're hearing about all of these horrific tragedies and, and things all over the world. I think we have to remember to do what we can do, control what you can control. And if you get too hooked up on all of these things that are happening that are so far outside of your control, you feel like you can't do anything at all. Mm -hmm. And it's demotivating, it's overwhelming. But there's a lot within our sphere of influence. There's a lot within our control that we can do that's positive. So focusing on that gives energy. It makes you feel actually a little bit more secure that um, at least you can make some little contribution. And maybe if everyone's making a little contribution, it adds up to a medium size or a big contribution. Um, there's a great quote that I saw in my Instagram stories last night about uh, um, that, you know, you think that small people, a few people can't really change anything in the world, but that's really all whoever did change things in the world. It's a few people that start a snowball rolling down the hill and it becomes a giant snowball and it does change the world. So I hope that we can quietly, humbly deliver on our ambition and our agenda and be open source about what we're doing if others want to learn. And uh, we're always a little bit hesitant to talk about it too much because this isn't marketing for us. This is about doing the right thing. It's about being around another 158 years. Um, it's about the feeling I get when I think, you know, this is someone's name. You know, what, would the family be proud of what we're doing today? And that answer always mm. has to be yes. Mm. Mm. And you have a program. It's beautifully answered. You have a program in your business. Uh, it's, and it's the joy of, t tell us about this. Um, uh, what, yeah. what, why, I guess, are you doing it for these reasons or is it is it aligned yeah. to this in some way? So our company purpose is all about the joy of true togetherness to inspire a better world. True, true togetherness. And that's, not togetherness, like I'm WhatsApping, you know, my high school friends 
It's about human connection. It's about truly being together, not in the metaverse, in the analog uh, IRL in real life. And the idea that two beers have historically for thousands of years brought people together to sit belly to belly on uh, bar stools a lot of the time and remember that we have an awful lot in common. Yeah. There was uh, an experiment that we did working with some really interesting, enlightened academics and a nonprofit called the Human Library in 2018. And, and this happened in the UK uh, with Brand Heineken. And the idea was they worked with some behavioral scientists to understand behavior, uh, human behavior and difference and polarization. And they brought folks together who had very different worldviews or were different typologies. And then they gave them a mission. And that mission, they didn't know it, but it was building something together. So they went right. through this challenge, you know, it's like if someone gives you a giant piece of Ikea furniture in one of those boxes and there are lots of screws and, and you kind of get overwhelmed and you have to work together and you're on a time pressure. And what they build is actually a bar. So they figure out, okay, we've just built a bar. And then a voice comes over the loudspeaker and sends them to a cooler and they open up the cooler and there are two cold beers. And then they play a video showing the worldview of the two people. And for the first time, they realize they're very, very different. And you might have someone who doesn't believe in climate change and a climate change activist, someone who is saying overtly they don't understand what transgender is all about, and you have a transgender person. And then they say to them, okay, now you have a choice. You can leave right now, or you can sit down and discuss your differences over a beer. Mm -hmm. And there was something within that that reminded us maybe there is a small something that we can do in this incredibly and increasingly polarized world right. to nudge us back together as humans. Because if we can't still get together around the dining room table with family, I remember in my home country in the States back the last uh, well, couple of elections, Thanksgiving was canceled in many families because people wouldn't get around the table because they had such a vehemently different view than a relative. And that's really not good for our communities. It's really not good for families. And it's also really, really hard because if you picked a topic, let's take the US Supreme Court just overturn Roe versus Wade, you pick abortion. That's a really emotional topic. I have a very strong point of view on that. And me sitting with someone who has a very different point of view and discussing that topic requires a lot of trust. And it re requires also a lot of skill because sometimes we don't discuss these things because it's scary and we don't want to say the wrong thing. If we're trying to bring the spirit of openness and we use the wrong words, we could end up offending the other person. And so sometimes you do the safe thing and you don't engage at all. But again, I, I'm not, um, I don't think this is good for societies and the amount of fake news and disinformation that's out there you know, there are wars fueled, there's violence, there's incredible tragedy that is mounting. And I, I can't imagine what it could look like if the polarization increases. So, so we have a, a togetherness project that we're working on. It's not formed yet. We're working with some amazing nudge theory experts and behavioral scientists and to figure out, is there something that we can do? And what I also love is inside the company, we can learn from each other and we can try things and, uh, and bring people together as kind of citizens of Heineken in a way, we're our own community. And maybe we can practice and upskill ourselves to be able to hold some of that tension and, and be brave to engage. So last week for uh, Pride, we have a Heineken open and proud group here, HOP. Now, of course we brew beer and it has HOP, so it's a clever play on words. And we invited the Human Library from the UK in to spend time with our employees. The Human Library is a nonprofit that was founded on the concept of bringing people into connection with others who they may never have understood or they were fearful. So you could have someone who had substance abuse, someone who's homeless, someone who's transgender, someone who's been abused, someone, um, name your topic, who's a refugee, you know, just somebody who represent something that you don't know about, or maybe you were afraid of that topic. And then they have uh, books, human books, you can check out of the library. 
And you get to spend time with these folks who are very open and sharing their story in a small group. And you can ask them anything that you want to ask them. And you don't have to be afraid you use the wrong words because they understand you're doing this and bringing the spirit of learning and open heartedness. We did this with our employees. Our CEO was there and it's a small thing. But over the weekend, I was hosting a little dinner at our house and one of the women that was there had attended and she literally couldn't stop talking about it. It just wow. touched something in her that this is a huge problem. And actually what we did, just bringing people together, we can do this. You know, this isn't that hard. If it's little nudges like that, that could make that snowball roll downhill to bring humans back together again, there's something here. So I worry about it. I don't know what the answer is, but we are, are really hopeful that there's a little bit of something that we can do to show up and help our communities. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, I think, um, by the way, Human Library would register that. That sounds like a fantastic initiative and brand. And we need so much more of this. I think, you know, we talk business, we talk technology, we talk issue this and issue that. But at the end of the day, frankly, it, it is a it is about human connection, right? Be it on, on web platforms like this. We had to do this during the... Um, the COVID period, like we had to adopt these video technologies during COVID, otherwise we would have met face to face and we still haven't. I mean, a lot of the people like I've interviewed, nearly 100, actually bar maybe 10% of them, I actually haven't met a lot of them face to face, believe it or not, yeah. um, because they're all over the world and we haven't really traveled much. It's We're still in that phase, we forget, we're still in that phase where we haven't gone back to what it means to be just naturally human. And so I think what you're doing, it's got what you're doing here is more important than you think, I think, because of the circumstances that we're in. We're not back to that human to human relaxed connection. Uh, heck, people don't even go to parties now. I mean, going on the local train or tube, sometimes you've got to wear a mask. I had COVID last week. Um, and, and as I was saying to you, so I think helping us to remember that, that true togetherness be it over a beer or whatever it may be, oh, yeah. is so important. Otherwise, you know, as much as I love AI, I'm a technologist, I do think that in order for us to protect the human race, we have to remember what makes us human. And I think love, empathy, consideration, all of these lovely things, smiling, mm -hmm. makes us human. And uh, we can be AI too. I mean, that's very, very boring. God forbid. So, I mean, I, you know, it's brilliant we have run out of time, but it's brilliant to have you on the show. It goes so fast every time we talk. And I think I'm taking a few very important things away. One is it's great to see you being so happy and well and energized. It means that you care about what you do still, which is great. Very and much. I think it's great to see that Heineken as a brand is actually doing some remarkable things, accepting that it's not going to be easy, mm -hmm. accepting there's going to be cost, ex accepting that returns are going to take ages um accepting that they're going to be people who are anxious who want to change but don't know how accepting that uh, young people are going to come in and they've got to accept what you're doing and buy into it and uh, have the, the the energy to capitalize it and also accepting that the world is going to perceive you in a particular way and you've mm -hmm. got to be able to communicate with everyone in some sort of way so they don't think this is greenwashing or they don't think well actually you're not really hitting the point are you Stacy, and I think you're doing a remarkable job. Lovely to have you back. Um, I want you to ask. Uh, I want to ask you to say a few things before you close off, because I know you have a family. I know you've had your own personal <laughs> journey of ups and downs, and mm -hmm. as I have, and, and so on. Um, the uh, the world ahead in the next five years will end up wherever it ends up. We'll make. We'll do the best we can, or the next ten years, or next twenty years, or fifty years. So. One day when you're on that porch, because I'm going to use that example, um, <laughs> you, you'll be a young grandmother. But when you're on that porch, uh, what are you what are you expecting your world to look like, given what you know today as a leader, as a mother, as a partner, um, mm -hmm. as a sister, no doubt, and, and so on. So where do you actually expect the world mm -hmm. to be then? Describe it for me really quickly. Hmm. Wow. This is a very interesting question. So much going through my mind. I think that the world will be warmer if we just start with the inevitabilities. I think there will be places in the Southern hemisphere where people can't live anymore because you can't get access to water and perhaps you can't grow. A lot of these are agricultural communities. So there will be a migration North. 
I hope that in the Northern Hemisphere, we have the foresight to think together and welcome these climate refugees in a way where we can all thrive together. That is only the right thing to do because we had our industrial revolution and made a lot of these emissions and we are now global citizens and we need to think ahead because otherwise we're gonna have a lot of conflict. So that's a, a climate reality, I'm afraid. Um, but let's let's do what we can. Let's still take emissions down. Let's take um, CO2, methane, you know, let's do everything we can. Every little bit helps. I also very much believe in human ingenuity. And I think there are some incredible people who are probably still very young today who are going to invent extraordinary breakthrough technologies, open air carbon capture that actually costs something that we can afford and all, all these things that will make a significant difference. And hey, maybe we can actually do better than the models predict when it comes to climate change. I bet we can. Humans are pretty incredible problem solvers. Mm. I hope that we will all have some kind of sense of human global civics, mm. maybe some increasingly embedded shared principles about how we feel and think about human rights, kind of uh, global respect for each other, because this concept of being a global citizen will be a little bit older. You now my kids grow up just seeing themselves much more as a global citizen than I ever did. So um, I hope that we will have a totally different relationship to mental health as they have for a long time in the East and in, in, um, in many countries, not as much though in the West, that we will value physical and mental health equally and that we de-stigmify all of these things having to do with, um, with our feelings and the, the wellness of our, our brain. So I hope for that. I hope there'll be a cure for cancer. Af. Gosh, what else can I put on this list? <laughs> Right. That, 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 is, that is very, very, that's a very important point you've touched on because we don't have a cure for cancer even today. I mean, it's, it's, it's sickening really. Um, and we've all had it or lost people uh, close to us and it continues. It's distressing. Uh, I hear you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I suppose to, to put the cherry on the Sunday, I really hope that we get better at creating communities where everyone feels like they belong. You know, I'm a mom of two boys, 13 and seven, and I think there's a, a generation that they could have grown up in when it was expected they would, you know, follow this path and get a certain kind of job and do certain kinds of things to provide for their family. And I hope that the community and the society they grow up in will make them feel like they can choose what they're passionate about. And that can be entrepreneurship. It could be staying home with their family. It could be joining a big business like I have. It could be maybe hopefully going into politics and becoming a politician because we need more young, fabulous people who are in politics for the right reasons. Um, but I hope that all of these constructs of what you have to be, need to be, which gender should be where, which age should be where, whatever it is, that that starts to loosen up and everybody's got a shot and you, you decide what you want to be when you grow up. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. I mean, that's, uh, you You came up with a really nice comprehensive list and, and not just uh, idealistic stuff, but I think realistic stuff, which is so beautiful. Um, it's been a pleasure, Stacey, as usual. Again, thank you so much for taking time during your busy schedule. You're doing some big work and you've taken some time out to talk to us again and talk to me, uh, which I'm grateful for. Before you go, a couple of, couple of uh, reactions on how today was for you. At straight talk i know you've been here before and you've helped us in the past and it's been amazing how do you feel today what what are your reactions today after this interaction for the last hour yeah i love that you don't give any of the questions in advance so i have no idea what you're going to ask this is very real it's probably the only podcast or conversation you know that i've ever had where it's just like just show up and let's see what we're going to talk about it today. And I think that is very much in the spirit of Straight Talk Live. It really is Straight Talk Live. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we wouldn't do it any other way. And I think, uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're brilliant at it. So thank you so much for coming back to us and 
Um, really, really appreciate it. You look great. Keep doing the amazing work. We have thousands of straight talk members now, or straight talkers, as we call them, by the way. And we even have a, a community of mavericks who do their best to, the, the individuals who do their best to make that change happen and create the snowball and a bigger one and, and a bigger one, as you um, nicely put it. And so we will share this with them. They might want to get involved with the work you're doing. Um, and so we'll keep this channel open. So Stacey, thank you so much. And uh, you've been amazing. And I'm going to look so. forward to seeing you again, hopefully not a year and a half, but at some point, <laughs> maybe we'll meet physically one day. That would be you know. thing. We can have a beer together. Let's do it. Yeah, we can have, we can, <laughs> we can totally have that true togetherness together. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Ash.